Hey everybody, I just want to thank you, me and Kathy Vogan are doing a pre-recorded special for the vigil. Um, we're going to go into a deep dive of one of the articles that she recently put out. Um, but first, just for those of you who may not know, um, Kathy Vogan is one of the executive producers over at Consortium News. She's done decades worth of incredible work um, and does an amazing, amazing job covering Julian's case. So I'm super excited. She's probably one of the most knowledgeable people that I know um, on the subject going back a long time. So how are you today, Kathy? I'm very well, thanks. So um, you recently released this new article into Consortium News. So I'm gonna pull it up on screen here real quick. It's an article specifically looking at the case, Julian's case in perspective of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge and what the new revelations about Sigur's testimony reveal, um, teenager as he's referred to in the court documents. So could you give us a little bit of, just a brief outline of what Sigur talked about before we dive in here and what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge really tries to, to frame Julian's case as? Well, actually, the article is, it's really about the conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. Part of the case against Assange crumbling for the second time, not just this, Sigur wasn't the first. The first, I believe, was in court, day 14, of last September's hearing with the testimony of Patrick Eller and to some extent also John Goetz, who talks about a, a very, very rigorous process of redaction, which is the very opposite of the image they're trying to paint of Assange. So the thing is that I go into both of those, what happened on that day to demolish the US's scenario of what happened in that exchange between Manning and a moniker called Nathaniel Frank, who was assumed to be Julian Assange. First thing that came out in that testimony was that there was no forensic evidence that it was Julian Assange, and he was never even asked to try to prove And that was that. something that was proven basically a decade ago in Chelsea Manning's case, that they have no idea who Nathaniel Frank Exactly, Franklin exactly. I remember seeing that part of the chat back then, it did come out towards the end of Manning's court martial, this little bit of chat about cracking a password hash or turning a, a hash back into a plain text password from part of a hash, not even a full one. And I thought, uh oh, you know, but then I, I really kept an eye on that for years. And, and it just seemed, to, you know, it seemed to me that, well, there is no, there is now a forensic trace and there is on my computer, I have a a very new Mac and it's got a fingerprint thing. So when I, you know, instead of typing in my password, I can put my fingerprint on my computer and I uh, can do it on my phone uh, as well. So that's forensic evidence, fingerprints, of course, classical. But before that, there was, there was no real conclusive proof that somebody who you think is on a terminal, um, even in Manning's trial, there were up to 12 people who had access to Manning's computer, the one that was used for downloading cables and all of that material from Cipranet. Uh, but Manning confessed, obviously not wanting other people to be accused of what she had done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the case of this other bit of chat, a jabber chat, the address was Press Association, but the name attached to it was Nathaniel Frank and it may have actually been Manning who put that in um, herself. But then whether it was Nathaniel Frank or Press Association, you just don't know who's there and you can't prove it. That's one of the things. So yeah, and plus there's the whole this. business of like in the indictment, it said that the purpose of cracking a password was to hide Manning's identity and make it harder to find who did it. That whole scenario was shown not to be feasible by the mm -hmm. forensic examiner, Patrick Eller. And on that secondary account, uh, it was well established in Chelsea's case that they were trying to access music and video games. And at the same time, wouldn't have had any of the access that Chelsea did to these documents in the first place. Well, that's exactly right. Manning had access to top secret. She had a top secret clearance. And mm -hmm. the access was actually pinned on to her user ID, her login. She could only access logged in as herself. Mm -hmm. And even if she had logged in as somebody else uh, to do that, 
it would not have granted anonymity because it was the physical address of the terminal, the IP address that was being recorded regardless of who was logged in. So that was all, you know, thrown on its face. It was very technical. So a lot of people didn't get it and they were still trying to defend Assange, you know, Every journalist protects their sources. Every journalist cajoles their source for more information. But that's really buying into the US scenario, which was that this was the purpose to protect identity. It wasn't. It obviously wasn't. And so now we have to step back from that, even if it is true. And of course, that's the reason that so many other journalists are around the world are in danger because they're the purpose of Joe Biden in December 2010. He said if he conspired to obtain the information, well, that's a totally different thing from throwing information on your lap. He did actually say that. So there was the playbook written by Biden in December 2010 of how it was going to go. Um, oh, yeah, you have, there's that video of just all of the people saying horrible things about Julian from back in 2012 that came out. And you have well, that Mitch was all McConnell part of it. That was part Joe. of it to start portraying him as, as a hacker. Mm -hmm. right? And you have both sides of the U.S. political spectrum, right? The Mitch McConnells and the Joe Bidens of the world coming out and saying that this man is a high-tech terrorist. Like verbatim, both said that within hours of each other on separate political winged news shows. Illegally so really shoot the son of a bitch. Yeah. Remember mm -hmm. that? The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure. I think the man is a high tech terrorist. Um, he's done enormous. Assange. Yes, he's Wikipedia. done enormous damage uh, to our country. And I think he needs to be prosecuted to the full, fullest extent of the law. And if that becomes a problem, we need to change the law. The way to deal with this is pretty simple. We got special ops forces. I mean, a, a dead man can't leak stuff. This guy's a traitor, a treasonist, and, and, and he has broken every law of the United States. The guy ought to be, and I'm not for the death penalty, so if I'm not for the death penalty, I only want to do it, illegally shoot the son of a Then I go into um, the story of Zigator Fordison, yeah, the star witness, in a second, a new attempt to portray Julian as a hacker that sort of collapses as well, because obviously Ziggy, as he is referred to by others, confessed, I suppose, that he, he had been, he'd been lying to the FBI and he produced some evidence that uh, he had been lying. We talked to Stunden, the Stunden journalist, Bjartmar Alexanderson, and he did explain that there is evidence, that clear evidence, not only that he was lying to the FBI, but also that the FBI was grooming him. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they, offered him, they offered him immunity in other cases. I don't know what those are, so I can't assume what those cases were, but he was involved in um, pedophilia. He's a sociopath. He literally laundered $50,000 out of WikiLeaks and fundraising efforts. This is someone whose testimony shouldn't even have been included in the first place, let alone have to be in there to then be redacted or not redacted, but but retracted by that person. In that sting that the FBI initiated, and that they had been watching over DDoS attacks by their man before they contacted Iceland with this rubbish story that they were that Iceland needed America's protection, that there were was an imminent threat to power infrastructures and whatever. And that wasn't the real purpose of going there. They deceived the Icelandic government. They also deceived the British government because they didn't reveal Thordeson's identity. Um, so they called, even though he's pushing 30, he's not far off 30 now, they call him teenager. Mm -hmm. And so the British court is unaware that they've got a convicted fraudster the pedophilia of, you know, nine underage boys, abuse of nine underage boys, it's terrible, but it, you know, the FBI would have said, well, that's got nothing to do with this case. Um, but it's the fraud thing. Kristen Raffenson said that there were two dozen organizations, individuals and organizations that he had defrauded. He had 
got the money that he stole from WikiLeaks by forging Julian Assange's signature. I mean, this guy is famous for mm. being a conman. So that's the thing that, I mean, in an American court, Thorson would never have been regarded as a, a credible witness, but then his identity would have been known. But, you know, they were just Ziggy and Sabu, or teenager, actually. They didn't even use Siggy because that might have helped identify jigsaw identification by the court of who the, the goddamn witness is. Oh, that's funny, because that reminds me of Craig Murray, of course. Yeah. But I will, let me jump into this and please feel free to stop me at any time. Sure. So we have the Assange extradition, why the crumbling computer conspiracy case is so vital to the U.S. While most of the talk about Julian Assange's case is about the espionage charges, which are political in nature, the U.S. case hangs on a thread for the second time on a non-political charge, conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. There is a reason why the computer charge is so vital to the U.S. case. Charging a journalist with espionage for unauthorized possession and dissemination of defense information has been possible since 1917, but it runs the risk of violating the First Amendment. The tradition has been instead to charge leakers and hackers for breach of an oath, contract, or firewall. The legal and public perception of hacking is that, much like a burglar, something generally feared and whose punishment by the state is subject not to political debate or opposing laws, but rather welcomed. The intrusion charge shifts public and legal perception. Since the U.S. is on shaky constitutional ground with an espionage indictment, the computer intrusion charge has served as a hook to try to get Assange by portraying him not as a journalist, but as a hacker. Underscoring the differences between the two is fundamental to the U.S. case. That's why the U.S. prosecutor James Lewis QC on the opening day of Assange's extradition hearing in February 2020 turned to the press in the courtroom and told them journalism is not the target of the United States prosecution. He said Assange was not a journalist and instead had participated in the theft of government documents. In other words, he is not a journalist like you, but a hacker. This distinction is spelled out by none other than the current president of the United States. When as vice president in December of 2010, he told television interviewer David Gregory. If he conspired to get these classified documents with a member of the U.S. military, that's fundamentally different than if somebody drops on your lap. Here, David, you're a press person. Here is uh, classified material. Declined to indict. Unable to come up with that proof, the Obama-Biden administration declined to indict Julian Assange in 2011. The New York Times had published many of the same WikiLeaks documents that Assange had, so logically the Times would be just as guilty of violating the Espionage Act. Indicting Assange and the Times would be a clear conflict with the First Amendment, but if it could be proven that he was a hacker, not just a journalist, that would have opened the way to indicting Assange, Joe Biden said. Faced with the same dilemma, the United States bolstered its Espionage Act indictment of Assange with separate charges for conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. This indictment was marked sealed, but then filed in open court on March 8, 2018, almost a full year before Assange was arrested, April 2019. On that day, the computer intrusion indictment was unveiled to the public. We have known since 2012 of a grand jury investigation into the conspiracy to communicate or transmit national defense information. A former lawyer for Assange, the late Michael Ratner, explained in the middle section of the code marked on the subpoena related to the investigation, 10 is the year it began. GJ is grand jury, three is the conspiracy statute in the United States, and 793 is the espionage statute. The grand jury was investigating conspiracy in 2010, as Joe Biden had suggested in December, in an effort to portray an Australian journalist not as a passive recipient of classified information he published. The hacking indictment that was issued on the day of his arrest argues in strained language that Assange had conspired with his source, Army Intelligence Analyst Chelsea Manning, to illegally obtain defense information. The indictment, however, admits Manning had security clearances to legally access the material. The charge of conspiracy with Manning hangs solely on evidence that appears at Manning's court-martial, a chat log between nobody, Manning, and someone with the moniker Nathaniel Frank. That Manning was seeking to help with a password hash from Frank has been held up as evidence of conspiracy. In the computer intrusion indictment of Assange, the U.S. claims 
Cracking the password would have allowed Manning to log into the computers under a username that did not belong to her. Such a measure would have made it difficult for investigators to identify Manning as the source of the disclosed classified information. This argument was seriously undermined on day 14 of the September extradition hearing when forensic examiner Patrick Eller offered his expert testimony for the defense on Manning's conspiracy theory. Do you want to talk to, to what he had said there and kind of how that pulled in? Because there was a few other witnesses throughout the court trial that also talked to, to similar things. Essentially, he refuted the scenario that the U.S. had put forth as a probable cause in order to give Manning anonymity and make it more difficult for investigators to find out who had accessed and disclosed the classified information. In fact, Manning only had access, Eller said, Patrick Eller said, to the information logged in on her own user ID. But even if she had have logged in as another user ID, she wouldn't have had access anymore, right? So it was alleged in February last year that the purpose was probably to install video games, films and music videos on the soldiers' computers. This kind of thing was forbidden when they were on active duty. And that makes a lot more sense if you want to install a game or something like that. It's a different kind of permission. It's a permission for the hard drive on the local machine. All of the information was on what they called a T drive. And to access the T drive, and Manning had top secret access, she was permitted to access top secret information. That would not have been an option logged in as something else. So that purpose was regarded as unfeasible. The other really major thing was uh, in cross-examination, Patrick Eller was asked if there was any evidence of who the person with the moniker Nathaniel Frank was talking to, if that was Julian Assange. And he said, no, there's no evidence at all. And also, were you asked? Were you asked to find evidence of who it was? And he said, no which I found very strange, actually, that they didn't even ask him to try to prove that the person on the other end was Julian Assange. It was just so assumed. But, you know, what came out there is that this theory is, is lacking in feasibility and forensic evidence. It is extremely weak. And the prosecution realised that back in February, I imagine, when the actual purpose, if that was the actual purpose, and it wasn't said definitively, but that was probably the purpose, the anodin purpose, and absolutely nothing to do with the material that was released. You have to remember that the Reykjavik 13, Guantanamo files, the Afghan war diaries, and the Iraq war logs were already published before mm -hmm. this little bit of jabber chat took place. So it's obvious that Manning didn't need help with a password to access the information and had already downloaded all this a very long time ago and approached various mainstream organizations, including the New York Times, trying to get this material published. And they said no. And it was only after that that Manning contacted WikiLeaks. So that fell apart. And that's why after, you know, the very first, there was three indictments. If I can just screen share that, I'll just show, yeah, absolutely. You, show people one, two, three to refresh their memories of the order in which these indictments so came out. Up, I do have a, a bit of a question, and this is um, sort of procedural about court and the way that it happened. We, as the community, the free Assange people, were under the impression that the U.S. couldn't change or expand its indictments after I believe it was 60 days after the original charges had been filed. But it seems like they had changed them and they called it expanding on, but they had actually altered the indictments multiple times leading up to, and then ultimately in September when they rearrested Julian on these June 2020 charges. So I, well, I just didn't know procedurally if it was okay, like how that would factor into the whole thing. Well, there were three indictments altogether. Mm -hmm. And this first one that I've got up, look, it was sealed uh, on March 6th, 2018, right? So that's a long time. That's over a year before Assange was actually arrested. And this is the one that was released first, just after it was unsealed, just after Assange was taken from the Ecuadorian embassy. 
And um, if you scroll down on this one, uh, you get that point 10 there. Cracking the password would have allowed Manning to log into the computers under a username that did not belong to her. Such a measure would have made it more difficult for investigators to identify Manning as the source of disclosures of classified information. So that's the part that Patrick Eller just uh, demolishes, basically. It's, this process could never have been followed to obtain classified information. And of course, Manning knew to some extent that she was going to be caught, right? Because the IP address of the computer, they could Even figure out which line, computer I mean, right? and then who was on shift. And then Manning just said, well, it was me. Yeah, if you just read line 11, right? Prior to the formation of the password cracking agreement, Manning had already provided WikiLeaks with hundreds of thousands of classified records that she had downloaded from the department and agencies of the United States, including the Afghan related significant activity reports and the Iraq war related significant activity reports. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so, even there in the right, indictment. Even in their own freaking indictment directly. <laughs> yeah, there's, 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 yeah, of course, of course, this uh, totally. Um, the way they put it, though, mm -hmm. I mean, the way I said it before, that sort of seems to imply that Manning didn't uh, have any communications with Assange at all for the majority of these disclosures. Mm -hmm. um, and and she wasn't right. necessarily the State Department. to be talking to Julian because there was a whole team at WikiLeaks that handled different things throughout the whole process. And, oh, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. And we heard that Um Professor John Sloboda, uh, co-founder of Iraq Body Count, he was assigned a particular batch and John Goetz, who worked for Der Spiegel, was working on another. Um, he was working on the case of El Masri, who was accidentally picked up by the CIA, taken to Afghanistan and tortured for five months. And mm -hmm. then until they realized they had the wrong guy, took him to Armenia dumped him up a mountain road and he thought he was going to be killed. But he finally made it back to Germany where he was living and lost right. his and, family. And while he, he was held in the salt pits of Afghanistan, right? That's the truth. That's like, that sounds like a call of duty map, right? Like the salt pits, like that sounds like a fictional freaking place. And just because the case of Mohammed al Masri just really fucking bothers me because this guy was literally just a dad on vacation. Right. He tried to do a hunger strike because he knew he wasn't involved in anything and torture shouldn't happen, even if you are someone that opposes a separate state. So he was literally forced, I believe, into like rectal feeding. Um, oh, uh, he, uh, the most appalling um, humiliation. And, you know, this was mm -hmm. there was a lot worse than that going on in these black sites. If you listen to yeah. what Craig Murray said um, about. Um, blew the whistle on actually when he was ambassador to Uzbekistan. They they tortured their children in front of them. They they put broken glass up their anus and they boiled them in oil, and people really got out of that one alive. Um, mm -hmm. And how they had set up all these Uzbeki citizens who were Uzbekistan imprisons its citizens. They're not allowed to go across the border into other countries, you know. And all these people signing confessions that they had been in camps in Afghanistan, you know, with bin Laden. Um, and it was just confessions obtained under torture, which everybody knows are uh, very unreliable, <laughs> notoriously unreliable. But yeah. I just want to get back to the one, two, three of this. Of course, this is the very first indictment. All that is on it is the conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. That's it. That's the hacking conspiracy was there in what Biden said. It was the very first word or fourth word, I think. He said, if he conspired, right? So you've got that word that's in there, that strategy that's in there right from the beginning. Now this is put out on its own to run its course and to have the whole world say, oh my God, he's a hacker, you know? And this is not about anything else. This is what we believed for some time. It's not about espionage, it's about hacking. Number two, which followed this one, that's where it's actually um, count one now, conspiracy to receive national defense information. So that's incorporated now with all of the espionage charges. 
mm -hmm. uh, when they run into trouble with this, you know, password hash when it's shown to be um, rubbish, and they know that in advance, then number three comes out. And that is the second superseding indictment where there are no extra charges uh, laid, but what they seek to do desperately in the case of taking a witness like Sigurd Thordeson, <laughs> Uh, and even Hector Monsegur, who is uh, Sabu, right? Both mm -hmm. of them uh, convicted felons. You know, it's really scraping the bottom of the barrel. You really feel that they've got nothing on this one. But there are other things in there as well, which, you know. And if you scroll up number three, because the the court documents talk specifically in, in like the evidence section, the parts that are laid out, I think uh, teenagers, um, Siggy's mentioned like 40 something times. And a big portion of it is outlining the interactions between um, Thordenson um, and a group called Gnosis um, yep. and how he was essentially trying to go out and recruit hackers to make it seem like WikiLeaks was this global hacking organization and build this narrative behind the scenes. Um, so that was, a, a, I believe, a portion of it that got recanted, essentially, that he wasn't working on behalf of WikiLeaks. He was essentially trying to set up his own operation and just waving the WikiLeaks flag like crazy as he was doing it on behalf of the FBI. Well, Andrew, what, what Ziggy was actually doing was recruiting individuals to hack into computers and or mm -hmm. illegally obtain and disclose classified information, right? Yep. But the thing is, the funny thing is that the FBI have given him immunity. He was the one who was doing it, not Julian. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know if they'll withdraw their immunity. They may. Uh, but, um, I mean, the thing is that they have granted him immunity. Maybe now that he has recanted his testimony and revealed that it was him who was actually doing this, will they indict him now? I don't know. Um, I don't think that was the purpose. The purpose was, you know, obviously revenge, especially for Vault 7. I think that's what tipped the, the scales. Two things tip the scales. Uh, if you look at that documentary called Hacking Justice, which just came out this year, and I totally recommend it. It came out in the festival of whistleblowing, dissent and accountability. Uh, the lawyer, Renata Avila, says that once Julian helped Edward Snowden, there was no further possibility of diplomatic negotiations and that Snowden's freedom came at the price of Julian's. Every aspect of this case is just absolutely heinous when you look at any of it in detail. Like even before these indictments are in existence, right? You have Julian Assange illegally having his Ecuadorian citizenship taken and asylum. Um, the operation between um, Rick Grinnell um, to facilitate the removal of Julian's asylum. You have the um, Operation Pelican that was taking place simultaneously to facilitate the UK police forces and being able to negotiate with Lennon Moreno to get Julian out of the embassy all before the indictments happen. And that's not even talking about UC Global's op observations of his interactions with his attorneys. So it's just the whole thing is crazy. But the, the fact that now this portion has fallen apart too, I think is super, super important. The thing is that it is kind of clear from the 4,000 pages, I believe, of chat logs between Siggy and the FBI and Siggy and WikiLeaks that the FBI were grooming him and actually setting up the sting, which was an entrapment, a, a way of using Thordeson to contact Assange and to try to get him implicated in some kind of illegal activity. The FBI are not looking very good at the moment. So, I mean, the whole purpose was uh, to bolster this charge uh, because given that that is the way in to charging Assange with espionage, that is the thing that drives a wedge between him and the mainstream media. The mainstream media are being bullied at the moment because they are, you know, basically the state is saying, are you passive or not when you receive 
classified information. If it's dropped on your lap, you're going to be all right. If you can go on the record and saying, oh, we don't do anything like that. You know, this is just theater because the majority of those mainstream organizations today, they have electronic drop boxes, right? The anonymous drop boxes that became a norm. WikiLeaks didn't know who they were talking to. I mean, if you don't know who your source is, then that's perfect protection for them because you couldn't even be tortured to give it because you don't know it in the first place. And that's just kind of become the norm. And so what goes on, I mean, and also, um, you know, you've got PGP, manual PGP encryption, um, you know, the kind that Edward Snowden has with your very long string that is your encryption key. And so when you're, you know, a serious journalist in national security, you're using these kinds of tools to keep your communications as well as private as possible. And of course, then you still have to take lots of precaution that you don't accidentally click on a, a link that is pretending that it's something else, but it's not. Like in the spy files, WikiLeaks spy files in 2011, they had revealed that there was a fake iTunes update. Well, with you know? the new release about Project Pegasus, right? Not, it's not like it's new software, but it's a zero click. So all they have to do is send it to you and they're into your phone without That's you right. even knowing it anymore. So That's they don't right. even have to do the screen share bullshit. They literally just hit you with Pegasus and they can just get into your device, even on the newest iOS platforms. Well, that's right. It's come a long way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that technology was there uh, in 2011, but it required a, your consent. Uh, do you want me to jump back into the article? Can... Uh, yes, uh, let's do that. And uh, I think maybe that's all I've got to say about this, that all of this was bolstering the notion that Assange was a hacker. Uh, because otherwise, if that charge disappears, well, that's coming up at the end of the the article. If we can knock this one out of the water, then he's in exactly the same position as all the other media partners who published the material. So Eller said U.S. couldn't prove, nor was he asked to prove that the moniker Manning was conversing with was Assange. And Manning's top secret access was only permitted on her login for what she had the password. Logging in as another user meant she would have been locked out, nor would logging in as another user given Manning anonymity, as the government alleges, since the physical IP address of the terminal was recorded, regardless of who was logging in. From the Manning court-martial, it emerged that the government knew who was on the shift at the time. In light of Eller's testimony, the U.S. scenario of Assange's conspiracy with Manning has shown to be unfeasible. The U.S. has heard early from the defense in February 2020 that Manning's purpose was probably to install video games, films, and music videos on the lads' computers, which were forbidden for those on active duty. Eller testified to the same. By the time of the chat, Manning had already passed the Iraq and Afghan war diaries and the Guantanamo Bay files to WikiLeaks further undermining the U.S. case that Assange had anything to do with Manning's actions. At her court-martial, she also testified that she had acted completely alone. According to what Biden said in 2011, it is imperative for the U.S. to keep alive the apparently minor computer charge that carries the maximum of five years in prison compared to the 170 years of the Espionage Act charges. But it isn't minor. Um, it is the hook that enables the charges of espionage. It smears Assange and it drives a wedge between him and the support of an increasingly nervous mainstream media. The second superseding indictment. In June of 2020, the Trump Justice Department, apparently unsure of the computer intrusion charges in relation to Manning, was strong enough to portray Assange as a hacker issued a second superseding indictment that relied on testimony of a WikiLeaks volunteer and later FBI informant who said Assange had directed him to conduct hacking operations. This evidence was apparently obtained by the FBI in 2011 when the witness was one of its informants, but this was not revisited until the Trump DOJ offered the witness immunity sometime in 2019, likely after the April 2019 issuing of the first computer indictment which did not contain his testimony. It appears in the second superseding indictment in June 2020. 
that evidence did not appear in the first superseding indictment might indicate the unreliability because the key witness has now recanted the testimony in an interview last month in an Icelandic publication, Stunden. Sigurdor Sordenthen's testimony mentioned 22 times without question in the magistrate's January 4th ruling against extraditing Assange, which the U.S. is now appealing. The U.K. court was not made aware of the identity and criminal history of the witness referred to as teenager in the second superseding indictment. Thordenson's chat logs not only negate the points of fact, they accord with what the Minister of the Interior for Iceland, Odnagar Jodensen, said and recently told Consortium well, News. They were in Iceland to try to frame WikiLeaks and Julian Assange in particular. Now, these are serious allegations, but I choose my words very, very carefully because I knew this from first hand from within the Icelandic administration. They were told that the, the idea was to use Sigurður, an Icelandic citizen, Sigurður Ingi Thordarsson, as an entrapment to contact Juliana Sands and involve him in a, in a, a criminal case to be used later in the, in the United States. This I know for certain. And I have stated this time and again in February 2014, before uh, 2013, I say, before uh, the Icelandic Foreign Affairs Committee in the Icelandic Parliament, where this was discussed. And uh, this, in fact, is, is not a disputed, uh, is not disputed. This is what happened. The FBI had resorted to working with Thordenson a diagnosed sociopath, convicted fraudster, thief, and pedophile. Stunden pointed out that his chat logs also revealed the FBI grooming and conspiracy and fabrication of false testimony. So that was actually an incredible interview that you did with that Icelandic administration official. Could you talk about what he said in particular and why it's so relevant to um, Fordinson recanting? Well, he talks about the FBI coming to Iceland and the, there had been, um, I mean, if you trace the history back, what actually happened was that the FBI recruited Ziggy and basically offered him immunity. Uh, and we don't know exactly what the immunity was for. I mean, there was nothing to do with all of this hacking stuff. There was never any investigation, police investigation into WikiLeaks in Iceland, that's for sure. Uh, in fact, they had, um, Julian Assange had co-written with Birgitta Jonsdotter, a member of parliament, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, whose purpose, so this is supported by government, um, whose purpose was to create a media haven. In fact, London had become the libel capital of the world if you had lots and lots of money you would sue newspapers in london and you were pretty well guaranteed to get a conviction to shut down a media outlet to, to get information censored that was a, a, about you and this this was very bad and journalists were becoming more and more vulnerable and i think that they could see it coming um that there would be an indictment. And we do know from Andrew Fowler's documentary, Sex, Lies and Julian Assange, this was Andrew Fowler's scoop, that he had turned up a subpoena for the grand jury. And that's where we get this thing that Michael Ratner is talking about. This is the subpoena that is mentioning the conspiracy statute of the Espionage Act. Oh, that was issued in 2011. Uh, Andrew Fowler's documentary was in 2012. And so we've, you know, just known that uh, this was going to be the way it would happen. So there was going to always be an emphasis on identifying Assange as a hacker and separating from the rest of the world of journalism and somewhat negating all of those over 20 awards including the most prestigious journalism award in Australia and Time magazine person of the year. I mean, that could be controversial in itself, but, you know, he won Amnesty Awards and all that. But people of short memories, um, I think this is one thing that really needs to be put forward, you know, how many 
journalism awards Julian has won, but certainly all the advocacy or the majority of the advocacy was to try to portray Julian as a journalist. And, and in fact, the main line of attack was always to portray him as a hacker. And before that, I was a rapist as well, mm -hmm. that whole Swedish thing. So, and also a cat torturer and a, an unhygienic person. I just went after everything, you know. The right. In the US, he got smeared as being at the same time a Russian agent, right? But oh, yes. a decade before he was yes. somehow a Mossad agent. Yeah. Like it literally. <laughs> so what they've done is they figured out what they have to say to a specific group and they tell them that about Julian to make them not like him. Like a, in a world that makes sense if we win, right? It'll be studied for decades to come how someone like Julian was allowed to be smeared in these ways in so many different fashions to so many different people. Well, yeah, I mean, that was obviously, uh, all of that was to prepare the public for the very difficult thing that was about to happen, you know, and this was going to set a precedent that would chill investigative journalism into national security for forever, basically. It was going to make mainstream media journalists shut up. All right, no, no, no we're not like, yeah, that's right, we're not like him, you know. Uh, and like the, journal, the Guardian journalists in particular, you know, they were so much involved. Uh, they designed the graphic interface and searchable database for those, uh, for the cables. But then they, you know, they really took a, a, and they were the first to publish as well, but they took a step back. Uh, but the thing is that the legal perception of something that is akin to burglary or break and enter, that is not a political crime. It's pretty black and white. And that part that came out first, that tried to run its courses, he's a hacker and all that, that was really the most essential aspect to the case as far as I'm concerned. It was there from day one. It was there in the subpoena that mentions conspiracy. And it was there in the very first indictment of those three indictments that came out. There's they won the computer fraud and abuse type charge. And then there was the first and then the second superseding indictment. But you can see this thread of it's about Assange's identity, right? But it's also a breach when I said or firewall, not just oath or contract. And that's something that, that a lot of the, the debate has been about, you know, like Manning's oath and but your oath is to protect your country. And people get into those tributaries of argument. But the thing is that the legal perception of breaking and entering is such that that is going to open up the door. It is the hook, in fact, whereby then they can pass on to the espionage charges because without them, Assange is sitting pretty like all of the other journalists, mainstream journalists and media partners in particular, who are still, I think, fairly strongly protected by the tradition of the First Amendment. I mean, the Espionage Act has its tradition as well, where it has been possible to prosecute journalists after printing. No prior restraint is allowed, but after publication, it was always there, but they never went there. The tradition was always just to go for the leakers and whistleblowers because they had breached something and it was kind of easy, right? But you can also talk about breaching a firewall, which is like breaking it in and entering. And then you, you enter into that fear center of a lot of people. You know, we're frightened of our homes uh, being broken into, particularly um, if you look at the ocean uh, personality scale, um, or set of scales, you know, you've got the neurotic people who score high, which is a large percentage of the population that are very much targeted traditionally by the right in their campaigning, targeting fear. Well, then, you know, you've got that as well as a deep psychological response to this notion of this guy, you know, breaking in. And then there were so many distortions. We, uh, Julian Assange always and WikiLeaks always had advocated um, transparency for government 
and privacy for individuals. But somehow it, that got twisted around where a lot of people thought that Assange, you know, I think even in The Simpsons, um, that Assange was going to break in and read their emails and look at the dick pics and that kind of thing. You know, that there were no dick pics at the time. But that kind of uh, thing was going on where, you know, he was portrayed as somebody who violated uh, people's privacy. And so discussions got into privacy. Um, there was other distortions that, that a lot of people made inadvertently, like Russell Brandt just recently. He meant well, but he called Julian a hacker. Um, I mean, <laughs> hello. He was actually trying to describe his nerdy personality, but to come out with a word like that, it was just. Uh, I had, you know, I had like actually some of the other. Uh, to Brand, uh, yeah, he, to do an interview with us. So, like. Well, the I other thing that that was that, that Russell was arguing against censorship and he didn't, not once did the moral dimension nor the specificity of the particular publications of WikiLeaks. Joe keeps teasing me about this, but I keep bringing up Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7. It's Obama's 2009 law about it's illegal to classify information that is going to hide the evidence of crime or simply save embarrassment. And Ellsberg would add, uh, protect people's jobs. The thing with, with Russell, what he was arguing for was there shouldn't be any censorship at all. And in fact, he didn't draw attention to the fact that, uh, well, in fact, he got it totally wrong because neither Julian nor WikiLeaks thinks that there should be no secrets. Of course, we all do, that there should be things that are, you know, for a certain amount of time. Uh, the, the study that Ellsberg, when I interviewed him about this, he was talking about a study that Stephen Aftergood had done. And uh, he was working with William F. Florence, who had retired now, but he was working in the classification system. And so he was one of the people that decided what level of classification should go on any particular piece of information and he found that it was only one half of one percent still needed to be classified today so 99.5 percent of what is classified is doesn't even need to be for mm -hmm. national security reasons right according to the guy who used to do that for most of his life uh, he, he did that survey so that's very telling in a way of how much, uh, and that was a point that was made by the defence in the Pentagon Papers case for Daniel Ellsberg, that far too much was classified anyway, but it never really held water, that argument. But the thing is, it is a million, billion times worse today. But in that little category uh, of things that were illegally classified because there were war crimes, because they hid other kinds of crime and, and uh you know, also saved embarrassment. Uh, you can imagine that in the State Department cables, a lot of them. You really have to talk about just that stuff. WikiLeaks always said the method is transparency, the goal is justice. John Pilger mm. said that that's Julian nailed his uh, colours to the mask. It was to be about justice. And so this is wrongdoing. He didn't actually, Russell didn't mention that it was wrongdoing that should be exposed, you know. Yeah. Uh, he presented a much more extreme attitude. Oh, yeah, everybody should have the right to know everything that's going on. You know, um, I'm sorry, but, you know, he, did, he said some very, very good things as well. But that was really misrepresentative of what this movement is about it's about justice well i think that that it more represents like what is when someone starts to peel back the first few layers what they see in julian's case because we have such a such a deep view of it and you in particular because you've been involved in it so long um but i i think he gives a, at least in my opinion like almost like a vulgar or unindoctrinated or whatever term you would want to use um, view of it. Because from the outside, that's the easiest argument to explain to people is that, hey, this is this is attacking free speech and this is censorship. Because it's it's in it's in the nuance where you find it's it's the important part. It's the meat of what's holding all this together, the hook as you call it. But for the for the layman, for the the couch political person, um, it's really uh, 
it's hard to explain that deeper nuance when they haven't even been able to digest the fact that the government's committed these crimes, let alone the fact that someone needed to expose them. Well, I think that, um, you know, everybody can understand it in terms of drowning, that mm -hmm. uh, it's gone down twice. <laughs> yeah. It may go down a, a third time, like Sweden. <laughs> it may be, you know, you've got to hit them three times to, uh, to end it. Uh, but it's just so much work, so much money, and so much time that this poor man has been... You know, it really is like Sam's that he's living through oh, yeah. in Belmarsh. Because yeah, Pilger it's... said there's not much difference. There really, it really isn't it. And, and before that, he was in the Ecuadorian embassy, which Pilger called Room 101, coming from um, 1984, which was the interrogation room, right, uh, that everybody feared. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been a, a terrible life for him uh, while they've been trying to relentlessly portray him as something that he's not to convince the world time and again. And, and I think that they've left it a bit too long, actually. They didn't get him in time because we have come full circle. Even the general public have come full circle of going, oh, I hate him, I hate him. And then, oh, my God, look what they did to him. You know, mm -hmm. uh, once the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention made their decision, right, and said he should even get some, he should be released immediately and he should get some compensation. And then Nils Melser came in with doctors that said that he had been suffering from psychological torture. He also needed an MRI. So he had uh, fairly serious health problems as well. He needed a chest X-ray as well because he had a, relentless cough and he, which he probably still has he's not a well man and his bones were like chalk apparently because he even damaged a maybe broke a rib I, I don't know if this was widely reported but this was in the the hearing in September but he'd broken a rib just from bending over to pick something up so he's not a, a well person you know they've, they've tortured him for a long time but the thing is that what's it's now completely turning around because the things that they're accusing Assange of are now being revealed as things that they were doing, that the CIA was doing, that, you know, illegally intruded into the Ecuadorian embassy to spy on privileged legal conversations with the defence. I mean, my God, that is incredible, but also um, in inciting people to hack mm -hmm. i mean the fbi are inciting siggy to hack you see what i mean well, that's, it's that's not super predictable behavior by the <laughs> fbi right they've spent the last since they came into existence targeting and um finding ways to provoke people to do things they otherwise wouldn't so they can try and stitch them up for it um yeah. and and you actually see a lot of similarities in the way that um, Siggy interacted with Julian to the way that, say, maybe Guccifer too interacted mm -hmm. with Julian. If you read those chat logs from the, um, not from the Mueller report, but from the release that came out about Roger Stone and um, his communications with Julian, they also had the Guccifer chat logs. And you can literally, the Guccifer 2 chat logs, and you can literally see a lot of the same patterns where you have someone trying to essentially um, ramp Julian up to do something that would get him in violation of um, some law or publish something that would be otherwise incorrect. It is said that there is a very funny episode where Ziggy and Sabu are trying to entrap each other because oh. neither know <laughs> that the other is an FBI informant at the time. It, oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, now we're realizing just uh, how cruel as well the us is barbaric you know really i mean i suppose it yes minister would call it appalling absolutely appalling the way that people are tortured in isolation it is considered in europe that 14 days an excess of 14 days in solitary is torture and john kiriaku told us on our show that there are people the us has in isolation total isolation for 44 years 
Mm -hmm. mean, it's just, and, and what they did to Abu Hamza as well. I think this is the other really scummy part of it that uh, this is the testimony that um, expert witness Lindsay Lewis brought out right at the very end, basically. And so Lindsay was talking about the case of Abu Hamza and the US wanted Hamza extradited from the UK. Now, he was a terrorist and he had, um, he had uh, accidentally blown off both of his hands. And the UK, for humanitarian reasons, said, do not put him in solitary. Don't put him in an isolation cell. And the US gave that assurance. And when he was on US soil, they did. They put him in isolation and he remains there for, well, last year it was eight years. So it might be coming up to nine years now. Not only did they do that, they denied him prosthetics. Well, and a horrifying so thing that's happening here right now in the United States, um, the January 6th protesters, like people that walked into a building on January 6th in opposition to whatever you think happened on January 6th, right? Those people have been held for over 180 days in complete isolation pre-trial in Washington, D.C., there's dozens of them. I think there's, at this point, um, a little over 30. Um, but then there's those same cast of people, but all across the country. Every state is currently um, pre-trial detention for tons of January 6 protesters. Like, I remember my local news bragging about it. So the way Julian's being treated um, in the British court system has come home to roost full scale here in the United States where there's just full on political prosecution. Like if you believe this certain thing, you are getting put in jail indefinitely if you're willing to even vocalize it or go to the street and take action about it. And something that if you pick apart the pieces looks like another FBI operation. Well, I, I, I'm not uh, terribly sure about the background of that, but it's certainly mm -hmm. But if you think about those people, it's it's certainly not the place to put a journalist because of their ideas. Um, Absolutely. Do you want to get back? I think there's like three slides left. Do you want to get back? Yeah, sure. Cool. Back to Biden. During Assange's hearing last September, after numerous defense witnesses piled on evidence that indeed Assange was engaging in journalistic activity, Prosecutor Lewis changed course and ultimately admitted to the court that yes, he may have been practicing journalism, but the Espionage Act doesn't make a distinction for journalists. Assange had unauthorized possession and dissemination of defense information, and that was that. With the recanting of Thornton's testimony and the weakness of the conspiracy allegation with Manning, the United States is back to what Biden said when he was vice president that Assange is a journalist who was merely doing his job by receiving state secrets pretty much in his lap. If Assange is extradited to stand trial in the United States, what would happen if the computer intrusion charge collapses? It would leave the U.S. with only the political charge and Assange in the same legal state as other publishers of the same material protected by the First Amendment. So that is the article put out by Kathy in its full glory. But yeah, do you have any um, additional like final thoughts about all this or related um, information? Well, the first thing I was going to say while you were reading it was just a little more detail on when the first day of the September hearing, when James Lewis QC astonishingly addressed the press instead of the court and told them this isn't about you. This guy, you know, was involved in stealing government documents, not about you. And I think the US predicted that they would bugger off. They've got their story, right? And they did. And in the afternoon, they were all gone. And that's when Lewis actually admitted, yes, every journalist is vulnerable. And they didn't hear it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that I would like to say as sort of like the looking forward kind of thing is I wonder if the US will try again. It's a little bit late in the game because now, I mean, it's impossible to bring in new evidence in the UK. 
Um, but the thing is that they may start up the smear campaign again, big time. And I was a bit concerned about Luke Harding bringing out the Russiagate thing again, because that reminds me of uh, the DNC lawsuit against WikiLeaks, where the Trump administration, the Russian government and WikiLeaks were all tied in together as co-conspirators. And that one just got thrown out of court. But um, I just keep an eye on him and watch what's going on there. Although, you know, I mean, the, the thing is that that one too works on fear and, you know, fear does tend to work with a large percentage of the population, the Russophobia. And, um, you know, a lot of it's d directed towards China now, but um, I'd just be concerned if they're going to start the smear again in some other way and try to dig that up. Well, in the, Keep an eye on it, folks. In the, in the judge's actual ruling where she rules against extradition, um, she introduces a whole heinous amount of other stuff. Right, like she pulls in the Official Secrets Act. Um, she introduces a random CNN article from 2016 um, that said that Julian turned the Ecuadorian embassy into a spy operation. Um, she cited fairness to the United States as to why Julian should remain in prison. Um, so that way a non-living, non-breathing entity can have whatever legal privileges it wants with this man. Um, what, but can one, I just one, interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Um, because um, the whole purpose of that part of, um, you know, all those other instances, the whole purpose of, of the uh, conspiracy charge was was absolutely parallel in England. What needed to be done, what, what she needed to do was establish whether there was dual criminality mm -hmm. uh, in, in relation to the Official Secrets Act. And so all of these hacking, breaching sort of things would actually find parallels in the Official Secrets Act. So it was also very important. That was that was a very, very big part of getting all those things in. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. but No, I just, no, I appreciate it. I enjoy. We go off on a tangent otherwise. Yeah. Well, the, the reason I bring it up is because if you look at the global intelligence files that we, we were talking about um, earlier, their plan that they've been working on for the last decade, um, almost 11 years, if not 11 years at this point, is to drag Julian from legal system to legal system and country to country. So if they're allowed to use the Assange precedent at this point, the UK will get their turn and then Macron can get his turn and they can just pass around international jurisdictions. And if if that's the the course that humanity takes at this point. So that's that's what I'm afraid of is we may beat this Espionage Act charge and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge, um, but we may not be able to then organize ourselves in a way to beat the charge that the government in Turkey puts out about the information or Israel puts out because mm. all of a sudden it becomes anti-Semitic, right? Yeah. Um, but, well, look, uh, what you're talking about is the other part of the playbook Right. The plan B, I guess, in a way. So uh, you're talking about uh, what's in the Stratfor um, mm -hmm. emails and uh, Fred Burton uh, talking about passing him around from country to country, from one charge to the another. And that's really that really uh, fits with the, with the cable that was sent, you know, to various um, allies asking to charge him with something. And we even had the Prime Minister of Australia saying it was a criminal act, and she's a lawyer, and there was pushback from the Australian Federal Police. Ten days later, they said, no, you didn't break any crime in this country. Um, so the thing is that there's that, and then they're, you know, they were wrong about he'll make a nice bride in prison, um, as that didn't happen. Uh, I think there's been a lot of solidarity from the other prisoners in Belmarsh. Um, you know, and they really, I think they, they got up a petition to get him out of the medical wing. Um, but the thing is, you have to look at it this way. Maybe the, the US knew they had a shitty case right from the beginning oh, like, yeah. and, and, and declined to move on it through, uh, you know, in 2011. They knew it was never going to work, but they could, um, through the process itself and, you know, uh, Julian even said this, it, it became very clear to him back then 
and this is also in an extract in Hacking Justice, which everyone should see, it was clear to me that the process itself was going to be the punishment. That, you know, they probably knew that, well, Sigador wasn't a credible witness. They knew that. Uh, and it would go down, but they just had to deceive the British, right, to keep it going. The, uh, the Swedish thing was a piece of shit as well, right? Yeah. It was, oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, look at Nils Melser's 19-page report. He speaks fluent Swedish. He's a professor of law, and he found over 50 violations of Swedish law and due process. Uh, Stefan Linskog, who was the chief prosecutor, came to Australia and in the Q&A, he said that there was absolutely no legal reason why uh, the prosecution in Sweden couldn't go to London to interview Assange. But then we find the CPS has been telling them not to do that and not to get cold feet and all that kind of thing. So they knew that was just about delaying, delaying, delaying. And this is the biggest travesty of justice because of that, that because they cynically know that they have a, a case they can't win but they can delay it forever until the man drops dead. That will just clean it up nicely. They're not going to Epstein him because, you know, there would just be riots, I suppose. Um, he's so much loved throughout the world. You've got Doctors for Assange coming yeah. on uh, in a couple of days on CN Live. They'll be talking about that. Um, it's just awful that, that, you know, they probably want him to die of natural causes. Um, they moved all the COVID well, yeah, if cases you, if you into look at it, They tried to, in my opinion, kill him with coronavirus in 2020. They moved, I believe it was 60 plus positive COVID patients. 67 his, uh, COVID cases into his wing. Yeah. And then turn the heat off. Turn the goddamn heat off as well. I work for a heating and air Wouldn't give him his company. winter clothes. You can literally buy a $35, $40 light bulb, an LED light called a, an air scrubber that you put in duct work that does the same sort of thing that water treatment plants do and use UV light to kill bacteria as it passes through the air in real time. Mm -hmm. That's $40. They spent billions of dollars on war and they can't afford $40 per cell to make sure that the air gets cleaned when it gets moved into someone's room so they don't have to turn the heat off in the middle of winter. Like that, that to me is like one of the the, the heinous, heinous things that happened is literally Julian had to insulate his window with books to stay warm in the middle of winter, in the middle of a pandemic, while they moved a bunch of COVID positive patients into his wing of the prison. Well, I mean, look, the thing is that the bigger picture is that this is all about this right of only a small number of people to have information and all mm -hmm. the rest, just whatever we're told. And we're in a bit of trouble since the end of 2012, you know, when the, there was the update to the National Defence Authorisation Act, um, you know, and that was big hoo-ha was about being able to um, arrest and detain people indefinitely anywhere in the world, this universal jurisdiction. But there was also the repealing of the 1948 Propaganda Act, Mm -hmm. um, you know, after the Second World War, American was not allowed to propagandize its people, but but that was repealed. And so starting 2013, we got the, the age of narrative, you know, big time and yep. just getting more blatant in the crazy lies. Um, but, you know, the, the whole thing is about if information is power, then, of course, um, you know, they know a lot about us and we know very little about them. That's kind of going back to that old British empire, you know, it, it really is. Uh, and of course, the Espionage Act is, takes its origins in the early version of the Official Secrets Act. It's got much of the same wording, just differences later. But uh, And even the 1914 Crimes Act in Australia is from the same origin as well. It's, it's the British, you know. Um, so this aristocratic view, you know, the upstairs, downstairs view of access to information. Um, and um, we, this... we do have to be careful about some information, but we absolutely do. Uh, well, but uh, there needs to be a monitoring of what is essential, a control, a stricter control of what is essential to 
keep private and you know all the rest that 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 would be better people know uh so that they can uh, you know have um make an informed vote uh for example one of the the things i found super interesting if you actually track the history of um, how we got here and the limitations of free speech um, in the United States in particular. Um, you can go all the way back to World War I, not necessarily the Espionage Act, but they were um, arresting journalists for reporting on revolutionary war era crimes that the British government had committed. Um, because at the time it was said that Britain was the US's greatest ally and that covering those stories would reduce US war fervor into World War I. If you covered British historical, they weren't war crimes then, but crimes against humanity. Um, and then it's been that union of Anglo-American dystopia growing ever since that. And I know there's times before, but that's a really big like crux in history for this um, terrifying British surveillance state essentially. Well, that's true, but I mean, uh, you have to understand where, where we are today. And I think that's beautifully summed up um, by Claire Daly when she said that the US believes that every journalist around the world has a duty to keep America's dirty secrets. And that's, that's basically it. And that's a very, very dangerous state of affairs when you consider well, the foreign policy of America and their ubiquity throughout this world. There is military power in a couple of hundred countries. The main fear is, um, you know, if we don't do what they say, and that's very bad if our journalists are, are not even allowed to disclose wrongdoing. This is a very bad state of affairs for the rest of the 21st century, I think. You know, something's got to give. It would be, you know, in humanity's best interest if uh, we um, we let the truth teller back out of the box. You know, but I think that's the fear. They, you know, their their fear that their fear is probably that he's going to reveal more horrible things. You know, that that, that we have not been aware of. That's we've been. I've been really missing WikiLeaks, although they have put out some important leaks lately. OPCW. Um, that was very important, but they're few and far between because unfortunately they are a small organization and they've had to just de devote all their attention to keeping Julian alive. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to and, thank you so hopeful. much. For, I was just going to say, I would like to thank you so much for joining me, Kathy. Um, I'll put, once we release this video, I'll put the link to your article in the description and I'll try to find, um, if you send them to me, I'll put them in there, the three separate indictments, um, for people to look at them themselves. Um, but if you could just give us some, some final thoughts and let everybody know where they can find your incredible work. Um, well, I am, uh, uh, the executive producer of, uh, Consortium News' uh, CN Live. So, um, but I also now writing occasionally as well for Consortium News, although I express myself best, I think, in images and sounds. Uh, that's where I have the most experience. But you, I mean, I thoroughly recommend that you go to Consortium News for all your news um, because there's some of the best writers in the world, really uh, very well-informed people. And uh, Joe does a terrific job of uh, fact checking <laughs> he really does behind the scenes and uh, so does Corinna who's an assistant editor um, and then uh, you'll see a link on the website for uh, watch CN live it's a little bit down at the moment because we're, we're doing our um, summer fun drive um, we rely entirely on uh, reader donations and viewer donations now um, we have no paywall which I'm sure a lot of people find um, really a relief because they're everywhere now, you know, mm -hmm. the good, the bad and the ugly are putting up paywalls, but maybe that's kind of a good opportunity for independent media. And there certainly is some really high quality independent media in the, new, in the US and 
in the, the UK and in Australia that I know of as well, and in France that I know of and Germany. So, uh, you know, this is our time um, and we just have to work out a strategy to um, outnumber them. And Jeremy Corbyn came up with that strategy, you know, um, which I've also, you know, been trying to initiate by picking up um, other, you know, simulcasting great events uh, from people who don't really have a, a um, like a, a well populated um, with subscribers YouTube channel that not many people would see it otherwise like maybe a hundred people would see Daniel Ellsberg get out of here uh, so I've been approaching uh, like about a dozen media partners and saying do you want us to simulcast and they would be, and we also that offer would be awesome to see I would love that yeah, well, we offer our streams as well. We've offered our streams to Don't Extradite Assange and to WikiLeaks, who have simulcast uh, material that we have generated. Uh, for example, the opening of um, A Secret Australia, the new uh, WikiLeaks um, Australian Australian leaks, the most important ones. So that's that's a really damn good read. Um, you discover so much about the organization there that, that didn't come out before. So that kind of thing. Um, but Jeremy Corbyn suggested that just try it with one 24 hour program uh, dedicated to Assange and that you all get together and you all simulcast this one program as, and you, you know, you're around the world so you can take it. You can, I have done this kind of thing before in, in an arts mm -hmm. festival where it was a 25 hour live stream and it went from one country to another so i managed the australian one for an hour so this is really it was very very simple to manage but this is the way he said that if you're all simulcasting the same thing you will outnumber the mainstream media because their numbers aren't so high anymore well that was the whole idea with um the vigil right because for I don't know, only, it was probably only like the first six months, we were only on our specific YouTube platform, um, but we grew and we're on um, Twitch, we're on YouTube, we're on Rockfin, um, we're on five different YouTube channels on top of all that. Um, so that model, um, literally the uh, my idea was to replicate WikiLeaks because their success came from working with so many other media organizations. So seeing you guys um, offer that is freaking incredible because that's something that one, it gets independent media creators, additional content that they don't have to produce, but at the same time, it gets your guys's message out there in a way that is essentially almost like narrative control, being able to push from so many places at one time to so many different well, types of people. The thing is when I, I um, started looking after the, the, the channel, the consortium news channel, I thought that what I tried to do was to follow the model of Bob Parry and form a consortium, right? So it, it's not just being generated by us, but we can bring in other, like we bring in other journalists onto the written platform that we, we could do that as well in the, on the channel as well. So um, it just seemed to me that this is the way it has to go. I mean, people are coming from mainstream media um, and I'm coming from broadcast as well as, uh, you know, an academic uh, background. Um, a lot of them still have this competitive reflex. And in fact, independent media is going to succeed if it is collaborative rather than competitive. Uh, I think that's what Corbyn, I mean, inadvertently said. I mean, I, I remember thinking, yeah, we're already doing it. <laughs> Some of us are already doing it, what you're suggesting. Well, we're seeing the very okay. birth of that in US independent media, um, at least like the left wing, because you have for the first time, all of these different types of creators with all of these different ideas and audiences coming together to like, uh... <clears throat> sorry, that was terrifying coming together to, to root out the pro-war voices that pretend to be independent media. So I think that that's a, a really cool development in moving that collaborative bar forward. Um, so I just, I think that that's super impressive um, to see people independently doing things like this, even if they don't realize that that's what they're doing. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, did we stand or something, isn't it? <laughs> but thank you so much, Kathy. All right, mate. Lovely to talk to you.